Hey everybody, how we doing? A little sleepy after lunch? I'm not gonna have you stand up and do something to kind of get some energy going. Hopefully my words will be so inspirational that whatever. Okay, so I have 10 minutes to go through my entire story and so here we go, put on your seatbelts. Gonna talk about how we co-innovate and how we've driven 75 proof of concepts and 30 commercial contracts that's part of the story, but it's the part CB Insights liked. Uh, MetLife. So we're a 150-year-old life insurance company. Um, we operate around the world, about sh sh short of 50,000 employees. You don't get to be a market leader for 150 years if you're not innovative, but innovation runs in peaks and valleys in most organizations. So my group was formed seven years ago um, to draw us out of a bit of a valley that occurred after the financial meltdown of 2008. Small group, we're a catalyst, we're not an R&D lab, and I'm gonna tell you a bit about what we do. That's me, Gartner, GE, MetLife, interesting stuff. So we, we do innovation in two ways. I'm gonna to try to distinguish myself from the other speakers, but it's hard because a lot of companies are doing a lot of the same stuff, but I'll give it a, I'll give it a shot. We run uh, internal innovation challenges. We have an ideation platform that's available to every MetLife associate. We run these challenges for a period of a few weeks. They range from 30 employees to 10,000 employees. We put challenges or opportunities in front of them and have them ideate and come up with great ideas. We also run in-person ideation sessions where we bring people together, we do intense ideation, a homegrown methodology, intense prioritization, and then a Shark Tank like Bake Off where business leaders then pick ideas, fund them, and advance them. So we, do, we try to get everybody engaged. We believe that diversity drives innovation. Diversity with a big D, diversity of level, diversity of title, diversity of tenure, diversity of age, diversity of gender, diversity of culture and nationality. We try to bring all kinds of diverse people together to come up with great ideas. It's a core principle. We also do external innovation, and it's sort of an ecosystem, and it starts with, uh, with universities and where things are being invented. So we have a strategic partnership with the MIT Media Lab. I have a team of people that are dedicated to work with the faculty and students to identify the cool stuff that they're inventing and so that we can look to see if we can commercialize some of it. So that's really the very early stage. The next stage is when they graduate and they have a great idea and they want to be the next entrepreneur, they start a company but they need guidance. So we have uh, the MetLife Digital Accelerator in Cary, North Carolina. Uh, we just graduated our first class out of that. Uh, fortunately, five of the 10 companies in the Accelerator are already in working with our business units to deliver value to customers. Um, and then the next stage is where a, a startup is more established. And so today, MetLife has about a $600 billion investment portfolio, as most large insurance companies have large investment portfolios. A portion of that we invest in alternative investments, about $6 billion. So that's uh, private equity, hedge, venture. Uh, 1.1 billion of the 6 billion is in venture. So today we're a limited partner in 17 leading venture capital firms. And my team works daily with those 17 firms. We gather requirements. We actually go through an interview process of 150 leaders across our organization. We find out what's important, strategically important to them. We put it into a document. We share it with the 17 firms. They find great startup companies. They bring them to us. We connect them with the business leaders. That's how we drove 75 proof of concepts and 80 contracts in a few years. That relationship that we have with those venture capital firms is really, really valuable for us, to us for a variety of reasons. It, it, it ensures that we have our finger on the pulse of what's going on but it also enables us to get some deeper insight into not just the companies, but, this, but what's happening in that whole segment. Uh, they provide really valuable insight. And, and we've taken it to the next step now, and we, we have begun, like so, much, so many others, doing our own investing. But I just want to draw one really big distinction between what we do and I think what most other corporates do. 
and I say most, I don't mean all, is that we are not a corporate venture capital group. We don't, ha we don't create pipelines, we don't lead investments, we don't do any of that. We are limited partners in 17 leading firms and we work with them when they have a company that they think would benefit from MetLife's expertise, MetLife's dollars, and we co-invest with an existing venture capital company. So it's a bit different than spinning up our own corporate venture fund where we have to source deals and pipeline and lead deals and all of that. It takes some of the due diligence burden off, it takes the pipeline burden off, and it allows us to invest in a short list of companies that are really strategically relevant to MetLife. We, our CEO does not believe that we can spin up a, a venture capital business and compete with the big, the big firms in Silicon Valley, but he believes we can partner with them and, and value for, get value from that, so that's what we do. Secrets of success. So here's one of the things that, I, that I've learned over my you know, 30 plus years of experience in the business world. Everybody is gonna say they wanna innovate in, in the business world, business leaders. Think about your companies, think about it. Everybody's, innovation is the hot word. I'm sick to death, frankly, of innovation. I don't know why I'm on this stage, but I'm sick of it. Uh, because it's, it's, you can't say, you know what, it's innovation is not really that important. We just want to execute our business. They all, but 70% of them are opposers. They're full of S. They're not telling the truth. 70% of the business people have no intention to innovate. They want to come in, they want to execute their business, and they want to get the hell out and go home with their family and kids. And, and, but they'll say, at, town hall meetings and stuff, innovation is really important. 30% of people actually want to drive change. The key to success is to figure out who that 30% is, and it is not easy. It requires forensic analysis. It requires Columbo-like instincts. You have to sit across from somebody and say, how invested are you in innovating, really? Are you willing to put your own personal time into it? Are you willing to dedicate budget and people are you willing to get up in front of the company and tell them that you're behind this idea and you're going to fund it? And if you're not willing to do those things, then maybe this isn't the right time for you. And so probably my top job at MetLife is to distinguish the posers from the genuine people, the people who really want to drive change. And it requires those really tough personal conversations to really find out where that person's at. That's just... I don't know if it's a secret, but it's what I do. Uh, we don't drive things on our own in my team. We're too small. That's not our mission. It's not like we're creating stuff, R&D lab stuff. We gather requirements. We find those 30% of people, and we bring them together. We don't advance anything unless we have a business sponsor, as I just described, who's willing to stand on a stage with me and say, we're all in on this idea. We love it, and, we're, and we're, it's going to represent the future, you know, part of the future of the company. The due diligence part was... Why not ride on the coattails of people that do this for a living in Silicon Valley? You know, why not use their deep industry sector expertise, their ability to identify good founders and leaders and entrepreneurs? Why would we create that ourselves as we look to invest or spin up new companies and use their signals? Uh, one of the investments we looked at recently, which we actually made, as part, of the, as part of our examination of this transaction, which looked really attractive, it turned out that four partners of the VC firm were on the board of this company, and that this VC firm had invested in this company from its very first seed round. That's the kind of commitment that we look for to make sure that they're really, they know what they're doing, they're all in, and they're committed to the transaction. Missteps, don't get fooled by those posers I talked about. It's really hard conversations, but you gotta have them to, to separate the wheat from the chaff. 
measure activity and results. A lot of people just want to measure the results of innovation. You got to measure activity. How many people you engage? How many ideas you advance? How many proof of concepts? How many challenges do you run? And keep the nap aperture wide. We started out with a more narrow, internally focused aperture. We broadened it to include universities, venture capital, accelerators, et cetera. Failing inexpensively. Oh my god, if I hear this one more time. Whatever. <laughs> I, I mean, obviously, that it's hard to do. The problem is people fall in love with ideas. They become infatuated, right? How many, every corporation knows people that it's like, oh my god, I don't want to go to another meeting because he's going to bring up that stupid idea again. I don't want to hear it again, right? People latch on to, to ideas like a dog with a bone and won't let go of them. And that's a really hard thing to break. You have to really understand not just what the company's doing today, but where it's going to understand where, you know, the Gretzky, everyone knows it, right? You, but you have to understand where you're going, and you got to have the right people. Probably 50% the pe of the people in your organizations are not up to taking on this challenge. I'm just being brutally honest. Is it? It's not advancing, so I guess that's it. That's my 10 minutes. Before we start, they found a phone. If your phone, if you cannot locate your phone, go to the CB Insight uh, information place. So check quickly. Um, great presentation, John. Um, before we actually delve into more details on sort of the broad framework, it will be, I think, fairly useful for the people here to hear about one of the successful proof of concept kind of a little bit. What, what, what are we talking about? So our, our proof of concepts range from uh, things that are helping the infrastructure of our company. So for example, the security. Um, we're a financial services company. The clients we work with are very focused on how, are we a secure partner to do business with? So we've introduced some, some companies that have te security technologies that sort of harden our environment and have allowed us to win business, actually. We've had cases where some of, one of our biggest businesses is an employee benefits business where we sell life, dental, and disability to GM, for example. And we've had large clients say to us, unless you meet a certain security threshold, we won't even accept a proposal from you. So a couple of the big wins we've had have been bringing in security companies that, that create a more robust security environment. So you wouldn't think about that as being like innovation, you think about new, a new product or a new service or a new customer experience. But we, we do everything from ranging from those infrastructure kinds of things all the way out to the customer, but also along the journey, enhancing uh, products that we've deployed that have enhanced uh, our ability to serve customers. For example, uh, AI that interprets a customer's tone to their, are they happy, are they sad, and, and prompt a, a call center rep to change their talk track based upon what we're understanding from the customer, so a better customer experience. Um, so a wide range of, of examples, I think, across the whole spectrum. I think, I mean, just to follow up on that, you mentioned that one of them helped you win customers, and, and I go back to your point about the fact that you cannot measure only based on outcomes. Yes. But you cannot not. Right. Right. You have to do both. You have to do both. Yeah. And, and so is any one of these proof of concept, and, and they seem to be very successful, is going to be a needle mover? I mean, you're a multi-billion dollar firm. Is there any one of these that has a chance? But ultimately, it's going to boil down to being committed by seeing that indeed there are outcomes that come. So in, in the time that we have, it would be hard for me to really get into sort of the, the, the molecular issues face, facing the insurance industry. I would say that uh, there are a number of companies that we're working with that are both uh, graduates of our accelerator and other companies that we've met through our venture capital relationships that over time we believe can represent the next generation of insurance products and services. If you look back at MetLife and our history, for example, there was no group insurance in 1920. The idea of an employer buying, buying benefits for their employees, we invented that. And that's now become a massive multi-billion dollar business. We are working on ones that we believe are like that. Things for the sharing economy, things for the gig economy. 
things that th the nature of risk for people is changing. And so we have a number of products, and, and I'd probably lose my job if I laid out clearly what they are. But yes, we have a, a, a number of products that we think are unique and can represent large portions of market share in the future as we go from pilot to scaling through to full implementation. We have, pro I would say, a dozen of those projects underway right now. So, so when you start outlining the funnel, and I would love to get more into that. Yes. Can, can you talk a little bit about the funnel and how do you make a decision moving from one stage to another? You mentioned the, the notion of open innovation, and it sounds a little bit like a tournament, so to speak. Yes. So one of the things, so many years ago, probably 20 years ago, I used to write a column in Forbes magazine. And there was one column I wrote that I remember to this day, and it was called Pilot Error. And what the, what the essence of the column was about was that companies routinely run pilots and proof of concepts and experiments and rarely put any kind of metrics in place to determine their success or failure. And so you run the pilot, you get to the end of it, you have no way to measure the success, or, and you're like, was it, yeah, it sort of it seemed okay, should we keep doing it? And, and if there's somebody like I was talking about before who's infatuated or in love, it'll live on. And in some organizations, they live on for months. In some organizations, they live on for years. We've tried to introduce a discipline that, in, makes, that says, here are the metrics. And we just ran one recently mm -hmm. in, our, in our disability business, where we clearly defined metrics of, of, of this idea of bringing people back earlier from disability. Bringing someone back, on average, a day earlier on disability has enormous financial implications for our company. We set metrics. We ran a pilot. The pilot was successful in that we did what we wanted to do. It did not drive the results we want, and we shut it down. Now, I'll be honest. I love this company. Like, I am infatuated with this company, but I can't preach the pilot error preach you know, without being true to it. And so we said, look, it didn't hit the, the guardrail. And so that's how, you, that's how you can do 80 proof of concepts into 30 contracts and, and do it. You have to be disciplined about And everyone, I, overstatement, many people say we do that. But often, they're not hard metrics. They're soft metrics. Will customers like this? No, will it move that promoter score five points? You know, will it generate new business? No, will it grow 5% faster than we're growing today? And, and so it's those kinds of metrics that are required. But, but then how do you balance between, on one side, you want to drive more innovation. Um, at the same time, some of that will take time. I mean, it will take time to mature. It will take time to show these results. Many of the VCs, when they invest in seed stage, I mean, they know that the results are going to come later. How do you balance? the hard metrics on one side with the long-term need for to drive innovation. So I was hoping that as your questions got harder, we'd run out of time. So, but you're asking hard questions too soon. But that's OK. Um, so uh, there's a professor at the Tuck School of Dartmouth, uh, VJ. I can't pronounce his last name. Would anyone like to take a stab at it? Govadadran. Um, he has put out a, a model for, for testing assumptions of good ideas that we use and we, we like. And it goes like this. It says, behind every good idea is a set of assumptions that have to be true for that idea to be good. And what you need to do is figure out out of that list of, so you sit down and brainstorm, you have an idea, you say, okay, so what are the 12 things that have to be true for this to be successful? Then you look at those 12 and you say, how many of them are we confident we know the answer in? And how many of them are super critical to the success of, the, of this idea? And you rank them. So some of them, you might say, well, it's got to be true, but we're pretty, pretty confident it's true. Others say, look, we really have no idea. You know, People go buy pet insurance. I, I have no idea. Let's, right? 
And then the other one, how important is it? Some of them are critically important, some of them are not so critical. So you find the ones where you have the lowest level of confidence and the highest level of importance, maybe it's three of them, and you run a pilot focused on those three because it's about learning. So those three assumptions may not be the ones I just described of generating 5% incremental growth or something, but it might be, are customers willing to pay a subscription for a particular kind of product? And that's the only thing we're really not sure about. It's really important to our idea, and we really don't know. So let's run a pilot and see what the take-up rate is on subscription. And, and, so, and the, the, so then you take those assumptions and you follow the chain until you're really clear. You get to the point of all 10 are true. We got something good here, and you, and you move it forward. But it's a step-by-step -step process. Does that answer your question? Yeah, no, very much so. I mean, I think that it's, it's a great, I mean, we say that when we look at these firms many times, the, the currency is learning, and, and so in many ways, what, what you are describing here is what's your currency internally right. to make the decision when they move from one stage to the other. Uh, let me shift to a different stage a little bit, which is the scaling stage. Mm -hmm. You talked a little bit about finding the manager within the firm and the unit that can help them scale. Can you talk more about that and how do you help these firms scale um, and, and sort of demonstrate impact in the long run? So. So I could, I could probably give you bullshit answers to these questions, right? And, uh, but I don't really like doing that. So um, that's really hard, you know? So it's, it's easier to get someone, th the steps I outlined of understanding the long-term vision, being connected into the marketplace, finding these capabilities that we believe can create new forms of customer value, and getting to a pilot. I'm not gonna say those are easy, but those are less invasive. It, it's almost like those are non-invasive surgery, right? So if you have to cut my knee open to fix my pain, I might not do it, but if you can just do it, if you could just stick a little device in, I might do it. So, so like the little pilots are non-invasive surgery. Right. When you get to scaling, it gets into invasive surgery, meaning, business leaders have to re-prioritize people and money and focus and message. We're gonna start talking about our business differently because of this innovation, because of this thing we're introducing, and that's where it gets really hard. And I can't say we've completely cracked the code. We've made some good inroads on that, but it really comes back to proving out the assumptions. You have to stay true to that learning and the proving out the assumptions and saying, so what part along this journey are you not getting? We have this idea, we have these core assumptions, we've proven out four of them, seems like customers like it, they'll pay a subscription price, they, they're not, there's not a lot of price sensitivity, we can provide, we can fulfill, we can manufacture the product. Why wouldn't, well, because there's a little bit of, uncertainty with what you're talking about, whereas I have more certainty with my business, growing 2% more next year. And so one of the things that we've done, and, and uh, my boss brilliantly uh, designed this years ago, was carved out a pool of money mm -hmm. that would help with those scaling efforts. And so, but you have to go with that business case. You have to go with the results of the pilot and you have to go with your data and your evidence to say, we'd like some money. So it takes some of the anxiety from the business owners out to say, look, we'll in effect either co-invest with you mm -hmm. or we'll invest entirely if we think it's for the good of the enterprise. And so that co-investment fund has been helpful. But if I were to say that we've really completely, we know exactly how to scale the great ideas, we, we don't. We have some good idea, thoughts around it. We've had some progress. We have not completely figured it out. So, so you mentioned about the co-investment, so let me take it a little bit in that direction. You actually spent quite a bit of time talking about how your relationship with VCs and the fact that you're an LP in of itself. Uh, can you talk a bit first initially, when you, you mentioned the term VC signals. Um, now clearly if they sit on their board and invest it, that's a good signal, but what else do you see? What other signals are you looking for? that are more nuanced, that cannot be obser observed by someone from the outside? Uh, well, there's, there's a few, um, and individually they might not seem like a lot, but collectively they're great signals, which is um, what companies do they sit on, what, ty what categories of companies do they sit on the most boards on? What categories of companies were they early investors and stuck with it 
for, for you know, A, B, C. What profile of people are they hiring into their organizations? If they've added new partners in the last couple of years, what's their background? What's their experience? The more junior staff, the analysts, where are they coming from? What are their skill sets? So these signals, you know, what, what conferences do you run into that, the, them at? What, what are the declared segments that they, so we look at all these things deeply. We look at each of the 17 managers we work with and we say, what are their defined sectors? Where do their part, what boards do their partners sit on? Where do they invest for the long haul? What kind of profile of people are they hiring? And those are signals to us of categories that we think over time, because we think that these 17 represent, if you, were to, if you were to ask me to pick one or two of the best, you can't really do that, right? But if you pick 17 of the leaders and do pattern recognition across them, you can sort of get a sense for what's really going on. And I, you know, former Gartner guy, I like to use the Gartner hype cycle. I think it's brilliant. Uh, which is the, the, the height of inflated expectations, the trough of disillusionment, the, uh, the, the plateau of productivity. You can see that through the eyes of venture capital people. When they believe something is, at the, the, is overinflated or when it's the trough, they're looking for those trough of disillusionments that are about to start to scale up, and we try to track that as well. Now, you, you spend, again, quite a bit of time saying why you don't want to be a VC. Yes. But after a while, wouldn't you be tired paying these management fees? Don't you want to go and actually, now that you have this experience and you might not want to lead the round, but why not join the round and actually play? We do. We do. So when they come to us and say, we have a, so we've allocated $100 million to do that, to join the round. But it's only under the circumstances where one of the partners comes to us and says, we're, you know, we're a seed investor, we're, going, we're doing an A, we think their capability is uniquely, uniquely positioned for your organization. They need a corporate, a, cor a good corporate brand as part of the round. Mm -hmm. And so we, we, we heard that for a few years and didn't have the money allocated. Mm -hmm. And we'd have to say, yeah, we don't really do that. We now have the money, so we, we invested recently in Enigma. And Enigma is an awesome technology company and a data company, data and analytics, data sources. You'd say, well, that's, you know, it's not an insurance, it's not an insure tech, but our business is just data. It's really all it is. It's data and a little bit of technology sprinkled on top. And so having, having uh, an investment and a close working relationship with a company like Enigma, for us, we think can be game, can be game changer. So we do do that, but, but here's the thing. I'd be happy to introduce you to the CEO of my company and you can have this debate because he has some strong opinions and he actually knows a lot about this. He would say that he can count on one hand the number of uh, people who know how to do venture investing. Now, I think his hand might have 20 fingers because I think it's more than just five, but his point is, the really important thing here is his point. His point is that there's a lot of amateurs that, that think that they're professionals at this. In fact, I think the journal recently reported that 95% of venture capital firms underperform the NASDAQ over the last 10 years. And so that illustrates the point. There's a lot of people that have no idea what they're doing. There's a few people that really know what they're doing. Why not, why not work closely with them? But that also might be because of misalignment of incentives, right? I mean, you have an incentive which is not just to make money on the firm, but to integrate that within your firm. Um, but, but let me take it again to a slightly different direction in terms of time, which is focused on, on people. And, and you had two important aspects of two important statements. The first one was the, the fact that you try to not be fooled by posers. Right. Easy, easier said than done. Right. So what are your two, three questions that allow you to separate between the believers and, and, and the posers? Um, I, I listed them briefly in, in, in my presentation, but the, for one of the first questions I asked is, are you willing to dedicate personal time to this project? And I'm talking about the senior most people in the organization. Well, no, you know, I I'm very busy. I would love to. Believe me, nothing I'd love more, but, you know, deal with Bill. He's two levels down. Like, <clears throat> you know, are you willing to dedicate budget and resource and people? Like, are you willing to stay with this? Are you willing to send the communication out to your organization saying that we're doing this and that it's really important? Well, you know, we're sending out a lot of communications lately, and I, I don't know if we're... 
So those are just things that say either you're committed to this, yes, I will dedicate personal time. I will send out a communication immediately. I will dedicate $500,000 and more if you need it. Here are the people I want working on it. If, and we do have those executives at MetLife and, and other places. But it has to be a conversation like that. Mm -hmm. And if it's not, then you have to walk away because they'll burn CPU cycles. So taking that in, in this, along the same lines, you mentioned the need to find talent. Yes. For, where, at what stage do you think is the bottleneck? Where, where do you think the talent is needed and currently is not there? And where do you think you can go and find it? Within the industry, a different industry, in the Silicon Valley? Um, so, uh, you know, I don't want to say all the obvious things. The world is changing and we're going digital and stuff. But the world is changing and we're going digital, right? <laughs> and so you have to find digital natives, right? It's like... I'm tired of my type of people, right? I'm tired of working with the people who are begrudgingly, you know, hunt and peck on their iPhones and stuff. I think the digital, the people who were brought up in this world bring a completely different sensibility to, the, to, to ideas about what will work. They're not always right. I'm not saying the digital natives are right and everybody else is wrong. I'm saying they bring, you have to have a balanced mix. You have to have these people that are digital natives who say, I don't really care about life insurance anymore. I care about paying off my student debt. And so if you can help me with that, we can talk. But otherwise, and so I think it's driving that balance. And I don't know that I can point to a particular discipline, obviously data science, AI, all that stuff. But, but just in general, people who are sort of tied into the new economy and sort of have um, some instincts around what is valuable to the digital natives, I think is, is a blend that too many companies don't have a good mix, and, and we try to drive that good mix. We're almost running out of time, so one final question. Yes. Interesting firm that you think are, is, is doing interesting thing in that area, in, in open innovation, innovation from within, outside and within the firm. One company that is... Doing interesting thing with the, along these lines of incubating firms, accelerating firms, working with a VC firm, or in an, any other model. Uh, you know, the, the, I would like to say MetLife is, uh, is the example, but maybe the audience wouldn't accept that answer. Um, there's a lot of, of going on, particularly with the newer economy companies. The FANGs are doing really interesting things. Now, now am I betting that the FANGs are all going to be around 25 years from now? I posted something actually on LinkedIn recently saying, which of the FANGs do you think will be around in 25 years? Who, who do you think they said? Which Amazon? of them is most likely to be around 25 Amazon? years? Amazon? Yes. Amazon. So, so, those, so those other companies are doing a lot of what you're describing, open innovation, new ideas. Google rebranded to Alphabet so they could do that. Um, but I would say they're doing it. I'm not convinced that they're going to be successful within our industry, these companies. I'm not going to mention them for competitive reasons. Yeah. There's one or two, I think, that are doing really, I'll say the reinsurers, I think, are, are experimenting more so than the traditional companies. Okay. John, thank you very much. My pleasure. Yeah, thank you.